Doctors with disabilities exist in small but measurable numbers. How did they navigate their journey? What were the challenges? What are the benefits to patients and to their peers? What can we learn from their experiences? My name is Lisa Meeks, and I'm thrilled to bring you the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Join me as I interview docs, nurses, psychologists, OTs, PTs, pharmacists, dentists, and the list goes on. I'll also be interviewing the researchers and policymakers that ensure medicine remains an equal opportunity profession. Welcome back to the Docs with Disabilities podcast. In this episode, Baylor College of Medicine Associate Professor Dr. Michelle Ludwig discusses navigating life as a deaf individual. Listen or read along as she and Dr. Meeks converse about accommodations in medical school and beyond, the importance of self-advocacy, and the benefits of mentorship through the Association of Medical Professionals with Hearing Losses. We begin with an introduction from Dr. Ludwig. Um, my name is Michelle Ludwig, and I am an associate professor of radiation oncology at Baylor College of Medicine. I teach at the medical school, and I specialize in therapeutic radiation for breast and gynecological cancer. I lost my hearing at the age of two. I had spinal meningitis. Fortunately, it was in the post-lingual setting, so I was already speaking before I lost my hearing. I also lost my vestibular system at the time, so in the recovery from this, it was discovered that I was not only profoundly deaf, but was not able to walk. So I had to learn how to walk without a vestibular system, which involved a lot of physical therapy and learning how to use your eyes as kind of a surrogate for the vestibular system. And in addition, having to learn to read lips. My parents were told that I would probably be best off placed in a school for the deaf and learning sign language. But since I was continuing to speak, even without my hearing, they decided that they would work with me and find an audiologist and speech therapist group that was willing to work with my residual hearing and help me learn how to function and learn how to lift read. And I was living in West Lafayette, Indiana at the time, so I got plugged in with the Purdue Department of Speech Therapy and Department of Audiology and fortunately worked with them to have good auditory management, good hearing aids, and subsequently an FM system for the classroom, and as well as speech therapy. So learning how to use my residual hearing, learning how to lip read, and learning how to kind of fill in the blanks. I can only hear the vowel sounds, even aided. So Understanding what somebody says, for example, over the phone, involved a lot of interpolation. I tell people it's kind of like doing a crossword puzzle where you have to kind of fill in the blank based on predictive interpretation or knowing what the person is talking about. I went to a public school and used the accommodations of the FM system during school. And then in undergrad, and med school was able to utilize the cult reporting system and continued using that and did my medical school at Emory and then came to Houston to do my residency in radiation oncology at MD Anderson. And I stayed on faculty there for four years. And then in 2013 came to Baylor I went into medical school to work with medically underserved women, and Baylor has one of the largest healthcare, county healthcare systems in the country that's tied to a comprehensive cancer center. So I was able to fill my mission working with medically underserved women there. 
That's remarkable. You don't sign and you have very little residual hearing. So a lot of your input then is from the captioning, from being able to read things as you go along. I'm sure the audience is wondering how that worked in medical school. Can you give us any insight into that experience? The hardest part for me was surgery because everyone was obviously wearing a mask and I couldn't have the cart reporter come into the operating room with me. I guess you can. I think some people do, but I, at that point in time, was either not confident enough or the technology wasn't developed enough to make that a practical option. So we had to do kind of a combination of things of making sure that I was extremely prepared for the surgery, knew all the technical terms of the procedure and the step-by-step portion of the procedure. And then I had an FM system that I gave to the lead surgeon to put under their scrub so that I was able to hear at least that person. And so we kind of did a combination of them speaking and then they had a specific question that I wasn't able to understand. They would write on the the scrub table in a sterile pen their question. So it was it was exhausting, it was stressful, and it was kind of a, a precursor for what our life is like during the COVID pandemic with everyone wearing a mask. So your medical experience when you applied and matriculated into medical school, was it fairly easy to have accommodations that were needed put into place? I had accommodations in college. I had the cart reporting in college, and of course that was back before the internet was really invented. So the cart reporter came in class, in person, with me. And now it's much easier in the era of Zoom and being able to call in. But when I went to medical school, the rooms were wired for sound. So I would hardwire my laptop in and then be able to click on the link. So that got a little easier. So I was glad that I already knew what accommodation to request. I think that's one of the hardest things for students, just not knowing what accommodations are out there. The other issue was the stethoscope. I I did get a lot of concerns when I was interviewing at medical school. Well, how are you going to be able to use a stethoscope? So I articulated the story of a woman named Helen Tossig. So Helen Tossig was an American cardiologist who developed the procedure called the blaylock tossig shunt, which was for tetralogy of follow, a, a congenital heart condition for babies. And she was probably one of the most famous pediatric cardiologists that lived, and she was deaf. And she didn't even use a stethoscope, really. Um, she would examine patients, and um, she could diagnose heart problems by touch. And actually, some of her contribution to the field of cardiology have been directly attributed to her using touch rather than by sound to um, understand. So whenever I got concerned about, well, how are you going to use that? I would tell the story of her that that was my plan was to learn how to rely on other senses and other input to make up for that. So at this time, there weren't really any commercially available stethoscopes that were able to be used with my level of hearing loss. There were amplified stethoscopes, but they required putting it in your ear. And then I'd have to take out my hearing aids. So Emory, my school, connected me with Starkey Labs. And I literally went to Starkey Labs, and one of the engineers came up with an attachment that I could plug into the stethoscope, an electronic stethoscope, and it went to the telecoil of my hearing aid. And he literally made it for me in his lab. And so I was able to use that to have some hearing. But I was, I was grateful for the uh, engineers at the Starkey Lab that were able to kind of take me under their wing and say, yeah, we can fix this. We can, we can solve this problem. Now I think there are a number of options. And Ample actually has a really good section on their website about stethoscopes that are able to be used by individuals that wear cochlear implants or different types of hearing aids. Uh, Ample. Innovation at its best. I love this, that before we had all of these, as you said, amplified stethoscopes and moderated stethoscopes, that you were able to just one-on-one sit and innovate with an engineer. That's pretty remarkable. 
And you brought up Amphil. And so for our audience, many of you are probably already aware of this incredible organization, the Association of Medical Professionals with Hearing Loss. It's a nonprofit that's focused on mentoring, guiding, educating individuals that have hearing losses and want to enter health professions. The past president is one of my dearest friends and colleagues, Dr. Chris Morlin. I'd encourage every listener to check out this great organization. One of the things that they do, as you just meant, mentioned, is mentorship. And Michelle, I know this is really important to you. And one of the ways that you see yourself giving back and helping build a pathway of professionals that are disabled in medicine. So can you tell us a little bit more about that work that you do with Amphal and mentorship and why mentorship is so important to you? Absolutely. So I think Amphal was really key in me developing the confidence to apply to medical school, to go to medical school. They have a conference, or at least they did about every other year. So when I was an undergraduate, I went to their conference in Philadelphia and heard the president at that time, Dr. I'm not going to say his name correctly, the Zazovi. Oh, Philip. Yeah, Philip Zazov, another incredible deaf physician. He was the one that spoke at the conference. He was the president at that time. And just being able to kind of go around and see all the different accommodations and and hear from successful physicians that had navigated the system uh, really gave me the confidence to go forward and apply. And I think Amphil has even expanded its outreach to develop a virtual mentorship program which I signed up for as a way of being able to give back on a one-to-one personal basis. I've been matched with a woman who is an undergraduate who is navigating having a new hearing loss and trying to understand accommodation in addition to the normal undergraduate anxiety of wanting to apply to medical school. So we're working through one-on-one with email or FaceTime or whatever she thinks would be helpful. So it's nice to be able to use my experiences to be able to give back. I'm also the faculty mentor for the student group at my institution for students with disabilities. So that's been a really neat opportunity to be able to give back. It's for students with all disabilities. And I can't even pretend to understand what it's like to walk on the footsteps of an individual with a different disability, but it's nice to be able to have that space for us to get together and be able to encourage students to advocate for themselves and request the accommodation that they need. I love that. You know, mentorship is extraordinarily important. And so your work in this space is important. And I'm sure as you've experienced personally, and as many individuals with disabilities experience, that there's a dearth of mentors available. Only 3.1% of physicians identify as disabled. And so it's nearly impossible for every student to find a mentor and then to find one that has the same disability or that's interested in the same subspecialty. So your work in this space is really, really valuable. In the next section, Dr. Ludwig and Dr. Meeks explore the topic of accommodations in medical school in more detail. Listen or read along as Dr. Ludwig shares the accommodations she utilized in her own training and discusses the challenges of advocating for yourself in order to receive the accommodations that you need. So one of the other barriers to inclusion or to becoming a physician with a disability, of course, is not understanding what accommodations are available or even what to ask for. And so can you tell us a little bit more about some of the accommodations that you used or maybe accommodations that you didn't know you needed, but then discovered you might need as you entered medical school? At least for me, when I've been requesting accommodations, the 
feedback is, oh, well, you do fine without them or you don't really need it. And I have to remember to stop and take that as a compliment that I'm at least doing well faking that I'm understanding, but to stop and say, no, you know, I really do need this accommodation. And I would encourage my listeners to be confident and consistent in their advocacy for themselves. So I have the CapTel phones in both of my offices. And so I actually speak Spanish. And the nice thing about this phone is it can convert to Spanish or English, so it can caption in either language. So that's been really helpful because otherwise I can't use the phone interpreters at work because we have a phone language line. Most of my patients actually speak a different language than English. So that's been really nice to have that feature. For teleconferences, either the cart reporter or I've been trying to ask people to convert from Zoom to Teams, which has a really good caption-based platform kind of built into it. And then requesting that people turn on their screen when we meet so I can use a combination of lip reading and the captions. I have a hearing service dog who comes to work with me And she pretty much stays in my office, but she's able to alert me when my phone rings or when somebody comes to the door. So that's been very helpful. The other main accommodation is I don't have a pager. I don't take numbers over the phone. So if somebody calls and says, oh, um, Dr. Ludwig, Miss Smith's hemoglobin level is X, I make sure that's communicated to me through text message so that there's no misinterpretation of a critical number. So I told the paging operator at my institution that pages need to come directly to my phone in form of a text. So somehow they've been able to figure that out. The question that somebody would have when they page me comes over the text, and then I can reach out back to them to respond to them after I've gotten the medical record number of a patient opened up. So I kind of understand what they're going to say. So that's the big big one. It, it's very hard for me when I get a number that I don't know and then have to call them back and figure out, number one, who they are, and number two, what they need when it's typically a critical situation. That is really great. That would be a really good practice for most physicians to make sure that they're getting things correctly. You brought up your service animal, Pam. Can you tell us more about what Pam does for you? So um, Pam is a hearing service dog from an amazing group called Canine Companions. So I guess the disclosure is in in order here. I'm um, on the national board for Canine Companions. It's a wonderful organization. It's the first and largest service dog organization for anything other than guide dogs, which are dogs for the blind. And they're based out of Santa Rosa, California. They have a hearing service dog program. So Pam will alert me by tapping on my leg with her nose or nudging me. And then I say, what? And then she takes me to the sound. So she alerts me for anything from somebody knocking on the door to at home, a doorbell, or my phone ringing, my alarm clock going on. She lets me know if I'm walking and somebody comes up behind me. She lets me know about that. And so she's been very valuable, both in the workplace and at home. In the workplace, you might not necessarily think that that would be that important, but when I didn't have her, during the period between when my first service dog passed away and the time that I got Pam, whenever somebody would come into my office, I wouldn't hear them and it would scare me and take a little while for me to kind of calm down from being frightened to be able to process and be able to get back to work. So she kind of helped me with that. The other thing is Pam and then my prior service dog, Marguerite, they kind of have a a dual role at work. 
a therapy dog. So as an oncologist, I frequently have to have what we call a gold of care conversation. So when we were talking about transitioning towards hospice care, and at least pre-COVID, this was a discussion where people's family would come in and we would have the hospice nurse uh, or the intake coordinator sit for the discussion and I would be leading the discussion. It's typically a very emotionally charged discussion. And I would always have Marguerite and now Pam be able to sit with the person. So not really a hearing dog role, but definitely helpful for my work in, in those settings. So she's been, Pam's been wonderful. We just got matched about a month ago, so we're still getting used to each other. The way that hearing dogs work is they understand the command sequence of, here's a sound, I go tell my owner about it, and then take them back to the sound. But I have to tell her about each individual sound. For example, I don't want her to alert me when my next door neighbor's phone rings in my office. I only want her to tell me when my phone rings. And I don't want her to tell me when somebody knocks on the office next door, just my door. So there's a bit of a learning curve to understanding what specific sound I want to be told about in my office. That makes perfect sense. The dog serves these dual purposes, both for you and at times for the patient. That's really lovely that they can do that. It's a nice byproduct of having Pam with you. I just want to go back to something that you said previously about individuals saying that you're doing just fine and you don't need an accommodation. That's really interesting to me. I suppose that you might think that people mean that as a compliment. And it's funny because when I heard you express this, I would take it as a microaggression. Like you're almost being pressured into not using an accommodation. And of course, that would make it easier for whomever is supposed to be providing that accommodation for our students or for faculty. And they often lack any power in this you know, accommodation decision dynamic. And so if you're a student that is told, oh, you really don't need an accommodation, you're doing fine. Or if you're a faculty member that's told, oh, gosh, well, you do just fine without an interpreter people may feel very pressured not to utilize that accommodation. So I think it's really important that individuals be able to advocate for themselves and be able to respectfully but firmly state, no, this is a need, and this need is absolutely essential to my access. Honestly, advocating for myself is something that I still struggle with. Now with so many meetings having been converted to Zoom, I find myself constantly having to email the organizer of the meeting and say, please include my captioner, please make sure when you set up this recurring meeting that you invite my captioner, or remember myself, if I accept a meeting that I need to forward the meeting notice, which I don't know how to do because I'm not that good with things on my iPhone sometimes, send it to the captioner. And honestly, if I forget that, then I end up in a space where um, I'm not getting as much out of that meeting as I should. So I think it's it's honestly something that I struggle with. I, I think a lot of my students that I work with want to try to see what they can do without accommodation, because there is this pressure, like you said, these microaggressions from well-meaning people that just say, oh, well, you're doing fine without this accommodation. And then they make the student feel like, well, I probably don't need it then because I I can get by maybe without it. And would encourage my students to push back and then to give themselves grace and be honest with themselves and say, you know, yeah, this is a difficult thing for me to do, but it's important for me to do. And then not hesitate to escalate if they're not getting their accommodations met to email that person boss or, you know, email their faculty advisor for input. This is where it's an appropriate place to have a mentor and say, hey, I'm not getting the accommodations I need. What is that next step I should take? Now I'm to the point where I'll push back and say, no, I need that or email somebody else for that. But I will say that 
I think in the academic space, especially for faculty, there's an awkward space because it's typically HR that's in charge of accommodation, and they're not the people that are actually involved in the day-to-day workings at the medical school. So I think a lot of times faculty kind of get left behind in that. The other issue is medical schools, there's a lot of space on diversity and inclusion, but in the medical school setting, that does not entail somebody with a disability. The NIH currently considers underrepresented minorities as somebody with a disability, but medical schools don't. So I think it's kind of a minority that's not formally recognized in in the medical school setting, and it's not formally recognized as an underrepresented minority. And as such, the accommodations, I don't think, have been formalized. I think the people that are assigned the role very often in medical school don't often know what the appropriate language is to use with somebody who needs an accommodation, how to do that, what are the available accommodations. The conversation now shifts to discuss barriers that physicians with disabilities may face in their professional lives, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, and the strategies that Dr. Ludwig uses to help manage some of these challenges. I wonder if there are things that persist in your professional career that you would say are barriers that are more difficult to address or to remove as you navigate your professional life. Do you ever feel like there are barriers to promotion, to practice, or barriers with your colleagues? So I think the two things that have been most difficult for me to navigate, first with COVID, with having to lip read and having everyone wear a mask, been an exhausting year and a half, in addition to being a doctor that takes care of immunocompromised patients. So I have basically two options. When I'm in clinic with a patient, I can ask them to pull down their mask and then sit Um, six feet away from them, or I can ask them to put on a clear mask. With supply chain issues being what they are, I don't have enough clear masks for every one of my patients. Now I'm to the point where if the patient's not been vaccinated, then I try to find a clear mask for them to put on. Instead, if they have been vaccinated, I try to, I double mask myself and sit six feet away from them and then have them put down their mask. But so that's been a little bit of a challenge. I just came back from a conference where I was presenting. And since I don't sign, having a signed interpreter was not an option. I did ask to be able to have a cart reporter for when I was speaking in case there were any questions, but was not able to obviously have a cart reporter follow me around all the time. And if somebody at the conference wanted to talk to me, it's not really an appropriate setting to have people put down their masks. So I spent two days really trying to strain to understand, again, only hearing the vowel sound. And if it's somebody that I haven't seen in five years, I don't know what they're going to be saying to me. So it was it was an exhausting 48 hours. I actually almost didn't go to this opportunity when I was asked to present. I almost just said, I just do it via Zoom because of the anxiety and anticipation of knowing how difficult the situation was going to be. I've been asked to be a visiting professor at my undergraduate institution next week. And the same thing, I almost just said, I'm not going to go because of the difficulty of navigating the mask wearing environment. The name of the disability organization at Baylor for students is called Got Spoons. And the students came up with it, and that's based on spoon theory. And spoon theory is a really neat way to understand the, how people with disabilities navigate. It was developed by a woman named Christine Miserandio. And She um, suffers from an autoimmune disease, which leaves her feeling weak and fatigued. And 
she developed a theory trying to explain to a friend what it's like living with a chronic disease. And basically, she said, every day you're given 12 spoons, and a spoon represents a unit of energy that you have to expend in order to go about your daily life. So for example, getting up, getting dressed, having breakfast, and getting to work, that might take away four spoons. If she had to stay late at work, that takes away extra spoons. And then if at the end of the workday, if she's used up her 12 spoons, if she wanted to go out to dinner with a friend, she'd have to either borrow a spoon for the next from the next day with the, the energy expenditure or just say she can't do that activity. And I think that understanding that theory has given me a little more grace with myself for, and understanding that putting myself in a situation like what I just did is going to leave me exhausted in that I do have to kind of limit my activity at the conference and and limit a little bit of my social work because if I can be able to take care of myself and, and things like that, otherwise I physically end up at the point where I just can't function anymore. So now I limit my conference to two days. I don't go out every night for dinner and make sure that I take care of myself because I understand uh, that I'd be borrowing a spoon from the next day. Michelle, thank you so much for sharing the unique barriers to conferences and professional events. I hear this from so many faculty with disabilities, that the conferences are not set up for individuals with disabilities, and that so much of the networking happens in the hallways or between presentations, and that these items are not accessible. So whether that be a sign language interpreter or captioning or physical space for those with chronic health or mobility disabilities, that the rooms may be uncomfortably cold, you may be sitting for long periods of time, and that can be very difficult on your joints. And all of these conferences, everything is so confined. It's back to back to back, of course. And then on top of that, you're expected to network at night, in the evenings, in the hallways, during breaks. And as you said, the conferences just aren't designed for you to be able to do that as someone who does not sign. When I think about what individuals or institutions can do, I think about a couple of actions that people can take to improve accessibility and to improve the welcoming nature of the environment. One of those things would be for people holding conferences to make sure you ask participants if they need captioning or sign language interpreting or any accommodation. So having that readily available and putting that in your budget and just assuming that people will be there who require accommodation is helpful. It's also helpful to think about the fact that captioning helps everyone, not just individuals with hearing loss, and that people can retain more information when they see it concurrently as a visual product while they're also hearing it. I think the other thing to say is that it's critically important to make sure that you have that language on your registration page, um, in your forms for presenters. And to your point about disabilities not often being considered part of diversity, unless it's something like the NIH, making sure that your diversity efforts include people with disabilities, that all of the language for your organization or your program speaks to disability as part of a diverse an important population and one that is welcomed and valued. And then whomever is making meetings for you, whether that's your admin or an assistant, have them ask about captioning or any modifications for the meeting as an automatic part of scheduling. And don't rely on Zoom or Teams or other platforms to provide acceptable amounts of captioning. We know that for some of these platforms, the hit rate or the accuracy rate is only around 75 to 80%. So if somebody were attending that meeting 
and they were deaf or hard of hearing, they would only fully understand 80% of the material. I think that you would expect that that would be difficult for meetings, right? And that you may even receive a complaint and that complaint would be valid. And we just want to make sure that every individual can fully access and participate in any sort of meeting, in any sort of event. So those are some of the things that at the institutional and individual level, people can do to make spaces more accessible for individuals that are deaf or hard of hearing, and really to make space for all individuals with disabilities. I'd really like to comment about captioning helping everybody. My institution recently put out a required institutional training, oddly enough, about diversity and inclusion, and it wasn't captioned. And so I you know, made the comment that that was kind of ironic and that really moving towards having open captioning available for all of these things in case not just for an individual with a hearing loss, but somebody who's in a space where their speaker doesn't work or they're taking the training in a busy clinic workroom and don't have their headphones and want to participate with looking at the captioning, or maybe somebody whose English is not their first language, and struggle a little bit with some of the technical terms in, in an unfamiliar subject. So I think moving towards open captioning or other kind of thing for everybody would really help things. Like when you go to a museum or something, and now I think a lot of places have moved towards having open captioning any kind of video that you would see, and and that's been, I think, helpful for everyone. I know that everybody that I've ever lived with, my siblings, my parents, my medical school roommate, kind of got used to seeing the captions on the TV, and now at home, they continue to put their captions on the TV, (laughs) even though they're not living with me anymore. So I think as a society, moving towards the auditory and the visual together and just kind of having that standard is really going to improve uptake and retention. In this final section, Dr. Ludwig shares her advice for students with disabilities who are pursuing medical training. Listen or read along as Dr. Ludwig further emphasizes the importance of mentorship and the value of being open about your disability. I think everybody who's listening to this, whether they have a disability or not, I think everybody needs a mentor and a mentee. I think that's just part of learning and growing as a physician or physician in training. Some of my very helpful mentors were not hearing impaired, but they can still be an advocate for me and encourage me to advocate for myself or take some of that load off of needing to advocate for myself if they're in a position of authority and and being able to do that. So I think not shying away from necessarily needing to only limit yourself to a mentor with your same disability. One of my mentees was assigned to me. I'm part of the dean of students office for the medical school. So I get 10 medical students each year, starting at the first year until they graduate. And I'm kind of their dean of students for everything. And one of my students, who's actually going to be on your Doctor with Disabilities podcast, so I won't take away too much of his story, but he was born with a congenital absence of an arm. And working with him to navigate going through medical school, you know, I don't have any idea what that's like to go through medical school with, with that challenge. But I think I was able to help him gain confidence and be able to ask for accommodation, be able to spend extra time in the simulation lab one-on-one with one of the surgeons to learn how to do some of the techniques, be able to connect him with a physician with a similar disability. So I think there are things that we can do as individuals, not necessarily with the same disability, to be able to help with some of those challenges. I think you bring up a really good point. Allyship and being a good accomplice for the disability community is important. We must all take up 
the aim of having accessible spaces and make sure that we're carrying part of the load and that we don't leave all of the work and all of the advocacy and education on the shoulders of people with disabilities. As a community, we must say, this is one of our guiding principles. This is one of the things that we hold valuable, that everyone has equivalent access to our program, to the materials and to the experiences, and that we are going to work in solidarity to ensure that this happens. I think if I had one last thing to say would be to encourage the listeners if they have a disability to not be embarrassed about going into public with that because I struggle routinely. Do I need to go into public with my service dog? Do I need to go to this presentation when it's going to be a lot of work for me? Do I need to go and be a visiting professor when it's a lot of work for me? And I think I need to stop and think about not limiting these opportunities because I don't know what audience I'm going to reach. I don't know what person is going to see me with a service dog and be inspired to reach out and look for that accommodation for themselves or somebody who might see me speak or hear me speak and that gives them the confidence to move forward and and do something like that. So I think that's kind of an important thing to realize and something that I struggle with on a day-to-day basis. Thank you. I agree. That's such a good point. Dr. Ludwig, I cannot thank you enough. It's been a pleasure. People are going to learn so much from this interview. Thank you for coming on and for being willing to share your story. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much to Dr. Ludwig for shining a light on her valuable experiences and insights in this interview. We encourage our audience to check out the links we've included to the Anvil and Canine Companion websites, as well as a picture of Dr. Ludwig's service dog, Pam. We hope you'll subscribe to the Docs with Disabilities podcast and join us for future episodes. This podcast is a production of the Docs with Disabilities initiative and is supported in part by the University of Michigan Medical School Department of Family Medicine and Disability Initiative, the Stanford Medicine Alliance for Disability Inclusion and Equity, and the Ford Foundation. The opinions on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the hosts, the respective institutions, or the funders. This podcast is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Non-Derivative License. This episode was produced by Sophia Schlossman and Lisa Meeks with support from our audio editor, Jacob Feeman.